Okay. Um, so to now quickly go over to sort of a, an example of this that might be more relevant um, for you, particularly with the neural network-based approach. Um, so one of the other data sets that's available, and this will be on the website soon, is a data set uh, we made of finding and measuring lungs in CT data. And so if you go sort of with the data preview, you can see that we have sort of a bunch of images that look like this and a manually segmented label of where the lungs are in the image. And so this is a fairly standard sort of image processing task of trying to extract something that you know a person can see quite easily, you know, this is lung, this is tissue, into something like that. And so if we take um, and so this would fall into the category of problems of sort of classification. And so we want to be able to take a pixel here and say, does this belong to lung or not? And so we want to come up with a list of rules that sort of assess how likely a pixel like that is to be part of a lung and make that ourselves. And so if you go on, like the Kaggle Data Science Bowl, um, this is what makes Kaggle, I think, so great. You can have um, people publish what algorithms they used to try to find lungs. And so here we have a candidate generation where they did a lot of other things, but one of the tasks they did was find lungs. And so they used a number of sort of morphology, um, component labeling, binary dilation, binary opening, and so a lot of the tools that we have covered before in this class and they came up with a list of rules for finding long. And so if you ignore kind of all the plotting code here, basically they apply a threshold. Where's that? Here. So they take the image less than minus 400 because that is sort of the cutoff on the scale that makes long. They then get rid of the borders. They cut out all the background so that you don't have any background in the image. They then label the different components. They then only keep components where um, the areas and the areas are below, are in the top two areas. And so basically what this does is it takes all the components you have, it takes the top two because you've done the sort on this list, and then you only keep the components that are in the top two. So if you have two lungs, you'd expect to find two regions, and so here you only want to keep the top two. You then do an erosion to sort of get rid of all the small components. You then fill in small holes. You then kind of superimpose it. And so we can run this on an image. So here's our input image. This is what we're trying to get out. And we can see kind of each step one at a time for what it does, and that we ultimately get out that output mask for the images. Now we can compare. This was the image we put in. This was the ground truth, which this data set includes. This was what this algorithm gives us, and this is kind of the difference. And so we can go and print out sort of a report of, you know, what's the precision recall F1, and this performs very, very well. And now we can show the segmentation over the original image. We can then run it on all of the samples and sort of compare it, and then make this image here where we see how accurately it calculated it for all of the images. So this is quite a useful data set because you have, I think, 180 images or something like that where you can try to find the lungs. And the lungs are all different shapes and sizes, and you have tumors in some of the patients and everything else. And so it makes it a very interesting problem because it's simple enough that you can try it yourself, but it's complicated enough that it requires a couple steps. And why this data set is interesting is because you can then use a neural network for the same sort of a problem, where instead of coming up with these eight rules and trying to figure out how big the erosion should be, and how what your threshold value should be and everything else. You can just make a very simple model 
So here we have a two-layer model where you put your image in, you have a dense layer, and then you kind of make an image out. How it exactly works, you don't need to worry about. Where after sort of one training iteration, this is the result you get. And so it's able to learn very quickly what it means to be part of a lung. And that, you know, we can make a slightly more complicated model where we now have two layers in the middle instead of just one layer. And it can give us a very accurate map of what this lung should look like without having us manually generate any list of rules. And so this is kind of a nice problem for understanding how machine learning prediction and sort of a neural network approach can be used to replace or enhance the tools we've covered so far. And so because this is a problem where we can manually come up with a list of rules for making the lung, we can see how that works. And we can compare how a neural network works because this list of rules we have here is not perfect. If we go back to the notebook, I mean, if you have an image that has no lungs in it, this won't give you a very good result because it keeps the biggest two components. And so if you don't have any lungs, it will either crash when it doesn't find the right number of things in your list, or it will keep the two biggest sort of air-like things it finds, which could be the pillow behind the patient or some other structure that isn't a lung inside it. And so even though we understand all of the rules here, we don't necessarily understand where these rules can fail. Because it requires a lot of thinking about what is this actually looking at and how is it working. And so I think this example is very helpful for kind of seeing this. And that ultimately what's important to do is to sort of keep track of these score metrics, have a set you're training on, have a set you're validating on, and be able to say, we have confidence in our model because we adapted the parameters, we decided what the threshold should be, we decided how big the erosion should be on a training subset, or even on one or two images. And then we applied it to another 100 images we'd never seen before to make sure that it actually works on a larger collective. And with you know, neural networks, that's a bit more explicit because you're actually training. And so here we split the images into different groups. So I think up oh. here we have our whole image data set, and then we break it into a training input and a testing set. And so we have 240 images to train with and 27 images to test with. And so we then build these models with the 240 as an input and the other 27 as the testing output. Um, but yeah. Anyways, those data sets are all publicly available, and the scripts are as well if you're interested in playing with it more. Um, I won't go into this in much detail because we have another, we have the whole dynamic lecture we wanted to cover today. Um, so unit testing is a very important thing to look into and use in your projects because um, you will probably end up writing lots of code or making very complicated workflows in nine. And it's very difficult to know when you've written a lot of code that all of it works well. And so what unit testing allows you to do is to have automatically a number of tests as part of your data or as part of your code that will be run every time you make a change or you make an update to make sure the functions are doing what you think they're doing. And so if you have a very simple function, like let's say you write a function in MATLAB called count voxels, you know, you want to test that when the count voxels is given an empty image, you get zero voxels out. And that when you give it this sort of I3, so the identity matrix, three by three, that you get three voxels out. And if you give it a 3D image, it also works. And so this would be kind of an example of how you would make the tests for a count voxel function to make sure that it's giving you the right kind of result. And in a style of programming called test-driven development, what you actually do is you define your tests 
before you write your code. And so you and the other people on your team decide what the tests need to be, and then you write your code, and as soon as all of the tests pass, your code is done. And so it makes kind of the backwards approach from what people normally do of writing code and then testing it, of writing tests and then finding the code that actually makes these tests pass. Yeah? And in your work, do you apply this well or you apply this approach only in some cases and which cases? Um, I mean, ideally you apply it to all cases. There are cases where this can be very, very difficult to actually do where it's hard to come up with a small sub-example. But the idea is if you break up your things into small enough pieces, you can test that the individual components still work well. And so if you look at any large project, if you look at tools like Scikit-Learn, like Scikit-Image, like Nine, like TensorFlow, all of them have millions of these tests because there's so many different people working on the same problem, there's so many different ways of solving it. You know, if you look at a tool like TensorFlow, it can run on a CPU, it can run on your GPU, it can run on your iPhone, it can run on an Android phone, and you wanna make sure that it gives exactly the same results on all four different of those platforms. Even though the code that's running is very different on those platforms, you want a neural network with these values to give exactly the same result. And so by making unit tests, you have the ability to show that a very complicated system is still giving you the same results in a number of different scenarios. And this especially comes up when you're dealing with very large data sets because you'll want to optimize you know, your count voxels function. Maybe you'll have the count voxel function run on the GPU. And you want to make sure that even though you've implemented on the GPU, it still gives you the right result. And it gives you the, right resu the same result you get when you're running on the CPU. And so these sort of things are very important to have. And there's different ways of doing them in different frameworks, but it's an important step to be taken. One of the easiest frameworks to do this in is Python, because you can actually have the tests as part of your code. So if you take um, I'll just use my own examples, because that's the ones I have sort of easiest. Or um, this, which is sort of the OpenAI gym. I guess it's a little bit hard to see there. But that you have sort of the name of your class here. And then you have a list of what are called doc tests, where you actually include what code you want it to run and what the results should look like. And this is then automatically run every time you update your project which means that you know, someone might come up with a much better way of doing image environment or a much faster way of doing it, but we still know that when we make a small, simple example of 10 by 10, where we have a view of 3 by 3, that it gives us the right outputs, that the score is correct, and that everything works well. And so this is important to have in sort of every situation that you work in, because then you have some confidence that your tools are actually working correctly. And that, you know, when you look at projects like this, this code, you know, this is all one giant function. And, you know, I can see here very easily that if you have less than two objects in this areas thing, you will probably have a problem there. So it might not do what you expect it to do. So it would be good to test that with an image that only has one object in it to see what result it gives. But because this is all one mashed together function, I have to now generate a raw image, so a CT image that only has one object in it, which is very tricky. And so if I had this broken up into little pieces, I could make it much easier to actually check that each piece was doing the right thing. So of course, with existing projects, it's very difficult to do these kind of tests. 
But what you can do is you can test something, and it's called um, uh, sort of the image J has these tests as well. Nime has a bunch of these tests too. Anyways, there's a, a aspect of testing called integration testing, where you test that the entire result on a sample data set is correct. And so if you had a giant tool called like count cells and it reads in a big image and it counts the number of cells inside it, what you could have as an integration testing would be, you know, there's this one, you have an image, you know that the last working version of this code said that there were 400 cells. You then have one test that runs this whole block of code on that exact image and it should spit out 400, which means when you go back and start changing things, you immediately see if you change something that affects the final result. And maybe you find that there was a bug in the original code, and that's fine, and then your final result should change. But most of the time when you're changing or optimizing things, you don't want the final result to actually change. You want the final result to be the same. And so this is a very good approach for dealing with other people's code, or when you have to incorporate another giant block of code into your project, that you can be confident that it's giving you somewhat reliable inputs. This is also important if you're using a very large tool from some other provider. So if you're using like a Mavis Lab or um, the IPL from ScanCo or some of these other tools, you might be using them to calculate some, or um, a Viso, to calculate some very specific things in your image. And what you'll want to have there is you'll want to have a test image with a result that you compute, and the test image should be as similar to your real data as possible. And then you can make sure if they make an update to their software that you still get the same result. And if you don't get the same result, then you should have some way of checking what they actually changed. Because it's a giant black box for you. You know, you have no idea how a Viso actually works or how a, um, you know, online API or some other tool works, but you do want to make sure that when you're analyzing something that came out of this, that the result that's coming out of that is consistent and even when they make changes, you're sort of not volatile to these changes. Cool. Um, so test-driven programming is sort of like this test-driven development I talked about before, where you, know, you come up with a bunch of sample images and the test can be um, everything from very basic to like performance tests. And so, you know, the shape analysis of um, should be zero when you calculate the anisotropy. If you give it a sphere, and so you can try giving it a number of different spheres, it must, you know, the center of volume within 0.5 pixels when you give it a synthetic image with sort of a um, sphere in it that you generated. And then you can have other tests like the analysis of a thousand by thousand image should be completed in less than 30 seconds. And so this would be then kind of that test-driven development approach where you define this sort of rule and then you optimize and tweak the code until all of the tests pass. And so that once it completes in less than 30 seconds, you get a report out that says all the tests are passed and you're done. But you have that as kind of one of your limitations. And until it can run in 30 seconds, it hasn't passed that test. Um, so yeah, I think we'll stop that lecture there and move on to the next slides, which we'll have to cover a little bit quicker. OK. So you kind of see, I don't necessarily need to cover this all again. We're now on this dynamic experiments part. Um, this is for experiments uh, that take sort of more than one time steps where you're looking at sort of what happens as something evolves or as something changes. Um, there's a lot of different useful papers on this, depending on what areas you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at sort of tracking methods, I would highly recommend both of these papers because they're very interesting comparisons of a lot of different approaches on different data sets. We'll just cover the core ideas of that quickly 
Um, and then sort of multiple hypothesis testing. There's some nice papers there as well, which could be interesting to read. So yeah, we have sort of the whole previously. We'll leave this out at the moment. So the objectives we have is to kind of what are the types of dynamic experiments we have? How can we design good dynamic experiments? And this is a very important aspect of this. How can we sort of track objects between points? How can we track shape? How can we track distribution? How do we track sort of topology? I don't know if that's useful for any of you, but it's an interesting approach to have. Voxels look at deformation and strain and sort of more general cases. Um, so we kind of have this general outline where we'll talk about experiments first. Then we'll talk about sort of object tracking, which would be the most important part of this. Then the voxel-based methods, where we look at sort of how do you do cross-correlation, how do you do some of these other approaches that we look at, and then how does this look actually for more general problems. Um, so 3D kind of are already difficult to interpret on their own. 3D movies are almost impossible, but 2D can be very challenging as well. And so if we look, I think this 3D image, I mean, this was the 3D movie we had, where you sort of have this foam flowing up, and we want to be able to track, you know, how fast are those bubbles moving, and how are those bubbles rearranging, and how is everything else happening in that image. And that's sort of an example of one of those simple problems. But 2D can also be very difficult to look at. And so if we, this is a, a high speed flow of sort of particles going by. And we want to be able to track sort of how fast are those particles. Do bigger particles move faster than smaller particles? Do the size change kind of what's happening in these images? And that's sort of the challenge that we're trying to address with this lecture. So for those of you who come from sort of more chemistry or food science, this is then kind of rheology. So how do things flow? How can we quantify where the individual things are and how they're moving? You know, this can be oil movement through porous rock, if you're coming from sort of the more geology side. Um, air through dough when you're cooking bread. So when you cook bread, sort of the way the bubbles move affects how the bread and the dough rises. And then, you know, if you're looking at a volcano, which will be one of the examples we have at the end, how the magma and gas move. Because how that gas moves around and how that magma rearranges is very important to know how eruptive a volcano will be. We also then sort of have deformation, where you're not necessarily looking at a concrete flow, but you're looking at how things change with time. And so this would be something like red blood cell lysis. So this is when the cells split apart in like an artificial heart valve. So how can you measure how frequently this is occurring or how much strain or stress is being put on them? Sort of microfractures growing into stress fractures in bone. And so how do you kind of track that growth of a fracture? and then toughening in certain wood types. And so this is kind of, as you apply strain, how do the mechanical properties of the wood itself change? And so the most important thing to cover first is how do you design experiments correctly? And so what we unfortunately encounter a lot of times at sort of the data analysis side is that people have already conducted experiments and measured a huge amount of data but they actually never really designed the experiments correctly. And so, of course, if you could measure everything with infinite time and spatial resolution, and it didn't do any damage to your samples, then you don't really need to think about experiments. You can, you know, do whatever you want. That's not really a problem. But there's always kind of a trade-off with these things that we do. And so, you normally can't look at the whole sample and look in really high detail, you know, there's always going to be a trade-off because detectors sort of have a limited size. There's always going to be a maximum number of images per second your detector can measure. You know, there's no infinite frame per second detectors. And sort of for the biology experiments, there's a zero cost, a non-zero cost for each measurement. And so particularly when we're looking at sort of these microfractures growing into stress fractures in bone, 
one of the projects I was working with had a huge issue with this because they actually were changing the bones by using x-ray imaging. And so the x-ray dose that was going in was high enough to actually sort of change the way the mechanical properties of the bone worked. And so you could see how a microfracture was growing into a stress fracture, but this had nothing to do with what actually happens in a healthy human body because you had damaged so much of the other materials in the bone that what you were seeing was how a uh, radiation-treated bone develop stress fractures. But that's a very, very specific problem and very difficult to apply to other sorts of problems. And so when you're dealing with measurements that cause damage to the sample or heat up the sample, you can't make as many measurements as you'd like. You have to be careful to sort of only have the minimum number which can give you the results you're looking for. And so kind of the problems are if you measure too fast, you know, you have sample damage. Um, you can miss out on long-term changes. And so if you look at a machine that can measure, you know, 8 gigabytes a second and you have 20 gigabytes of memory, then your memory is filled up very quickly. And so if you're trying to look at long-term changes that happen over the course of minutes, then you won't really be able to see that very easily because your memory is full after three seconds. And you can end up with very, very noisy data that's difficult to post-process. So if you measure as quickly as you possibly can, a lot of times your noise level is very high, and so it can be very difficult to actually extract or segment the features you're interested in to do this kind of analysis. Of course, if you measure too slow, you'll miss sort of small rapid changes, and you might have blurring or other motion artifacts, so that if things in the sample are changing while you're actually doing the measurement, you can get some of these effects. You know, if you have too high resolution, your field of view might be too small, to actually see something move around in your image. If you have too low of a resolution, you might not be sensitive enough to kind of the smaller changes. And so if you're looking at really tiny bubbles and you have a very low resolution, you might never see them go through. And so one of the most important steps before you start to do dynamic experiments is to do some sorts of simulations. And this is kind of what we've had a number of times in this course is because it's so difficult to know or estimate a lot of these things with simple rules, you really have to make a simulation that models your experiment and your system as well as you possibly can in order to try to see what that actually will look like. And so basically what you can um, do is you can take a uh, very simple model from your experiment and add things like noise and jitter and variability to try to see how that looks and what the result might be. And so we'll skip this because we just covered it, but basically here we take a very simple starting image and so here we say we have a number of spheres. They all have the same radius and they're scattered evenly across the field of view. And so now we can kind of see what that looks like. We can kind of do our standard analysis that we do with, you know, threshold, component label, shape analysis, distribution, whatever. And now we can sort of add a motion to it. And so here we can sort of say our motion vector is this very simple, uniform, you know, up 0.1 per second or whatever our unit of time might be. We can also sort of make a more complicated one where, you know, we try to have the direction change as you go around and sort of like maybe a spiral-like flow. We can then say, okay, this is what our experiment looks like. This is time zero. This is time 0.25, time 0.5, time 0.7, 1, and so on. So we can generate this whole series of image frames to see what that actually looks like. We can then start to add in effects that might be important for the system that we're doing. And so here you'd have something like random appearance and disappearance. And so you know you might see a blob here and then you don't see it in the next frame. And then you see it again in the frame after that. And you want to have something that kind of accounts for that. And so here you artificially add and remove these blobs so that you can see sort of what happens in your image. You can then start to add motion noise, where you sort of add a 
you know, random offset and a random angle to all of your velocity positions. So that instead of being kind of a constant upward flow, you have some noise in your motion and your flow. And so now you can see that, you know, if you take a, um, like the experiment we had before, and you add that jitter, it becomes much more difficult to track what actually happens with these bubbles. So that maybe from here to here is fairly clear. But once you get onto some of these further slides, making that track is very difficult to actually do. And so what you want to be able to see here is when you add all of these different effects, like flow rate, flow type, density, appearance, disappearance, jitter, particle uniqueness, it becomes sort of more and more difficult to see, at least visually, what you're able to track. And what this simulation helps us do is that we can now create a synthetic data set and then create an algorithm to try to track our points through this synthetic data set and see what we need to do in order to track the points reliably. And so, you know, maybe with this we could skip every other frame and still track accurately. But if we skipped every three frames, or if we skipped you know, these two and used only sort of this first column, it might be very difficult to track that, you know, to figure out that these three points form this one giant point. And so with this, we kind of have a starting point where we know exactly where this point came from. We have that information. So we're able to validate our model and we can see how well it works. Because if we don't have that, then we might say that this point maps to this point, but you could just as easily say that this point maps to that point, and there's no way of knowing what it actually is. You can say some things might be more likely, or the further it moves, the less realistic it is, but ultimately, unless you've made this kind of simulation yourself, it's very difficult to say what those points actually map to. And so what this allows us to do is to actually pick acquisition and experimental parameters that are likely to give us something that we can track later. And so rather than sort of doing an experiment and trying to come up with some magic algorithm that's capable of tracking, we do some simulations first to try to figure out what is actually possible to track. You know, if we use the best algorithm that you know, was in this Nature article where they compare 20 different algorithms, and that's what it's able to track, then we want to make sure the experiment we're doing falls within that bounds. Because if the jitter is too high, or if the bubbles are too small, or we're measuring too slowly, and we can't track that anymore, then the whole experiment's worthless, because we can't really show what's going on. And so, um, what this means is, you know, the easiest things, of course, to tune are with the acquisition parameters, that you can change how frequently measurements are taken. You can adjust um, sort of the resolution of your sensor or the field of view by kind of zooming in or zooming out. With the experimental parameters, it's a little bit more difficult. You know, if you're measuring a flow, then probably you have some sort of pressure canister that you can increase the pressure or decrease the pressure to make that slope flow slower or faster. You can change sort of the poly dispersity of your solution, so how unique your particles are. You know, if you go back here, if all the particles are exactly the same size, then, you know, it's pretty difficult to track them. You know, from here to here, you can say that they, you know, move that way because the two images sort of overlap if you were to put them on top of each other. But as soon as you go from here to here, it's very difficult to say which particles actually ended up where because all of the particles look exactly the same. Whereas if you had a particle here that was really big and a particle here that was really small, you know that it's probably fairly unlikely that a small particle grew by 500% and a large particle shrunk. And so you could use that size or that shape as sort of an additional parameter for helping you track what's going on in the system. Um, you know, you can also control things like vibration and temperature and sort of the mixture. So how many of these particles are there? And so with here, 
the density is very high. So there's a lot of particles per sort of field of view. And if you reduce this down to two particles, it would be very easy to, or much easier to track them because you only have two things you're looking at. Um, so now, kind of the tracking approach that we use, and what we'll have in the exercises is kind of this nearest neighbor tracking, where you basically say, you have an image or a point at time zero, and you have an image at time one, and you want to find for each point at time one, what is the closest point at time zero that matches up to it? And so if effectively what you do is kind of go through all the points, calculate the distance, and take the minimum one for each point. Fairly straightforward approach. You can then come up with a score. So with this, the score would be the distance between those two points as kind of your starting point. So you have this um, uh, Euclidean norm that you're taking, and that would be the score of the tracking. So the further apart those points were, the lower the score would be. So things that were very close get a high score, things that are very far away get a low score. And so now we can now do a very basic simulation where we have a number of different object IDs. And we have them kind of flow along this straight line. So we have the coordinates. There's a little bit of jitter. We can now do nearest neighbor tracking on that image. And we can see how well it actually tracked. And we saw that for this data set, it works perfectly. So it tracked all of the objects correctly. There were no issues with what it was tracking. And all of the code for this is available in the handout if you click on that link, and then you can see what was actually implemented and how the tracking was done. But for presenting, it's much easier to just show the results. You can then take a more complicated flow. So now if you say, actually, there's no upward flow, it's kind of a Brownian motion. And of course, that's not the real model for Brownian motion, but it looks kind of like that. Um, you, know, you have a simulation that looks like this where sort of each point on that line is where that was at a given point in time. You can now do nearest neighbor tracking and sort of show what you tracked and that you have everything tracked correctly. Yeah, and so what you can start to do is you can start to take all the measurements and you know ensure they're all in the same coordinate system, that everything's kind of matched up, and so that the movement of the sample is in fact the sample itself and not some sort of shift in the camera or change in some other part of the system. So you kind of correct for any overall trends in the data. So now what we can start to do is we can take an experiment where you sort of have no offset, which is this very simple, the, um, nearest neighbor model, fixed offset, where you kind of account for the fact that there's some constant shift in the whole image, and then adaptive offset, where you then take the whole series, you find the nearest neighbors for all of them, you take the average nearest neighbor distance as sort of the baseline, and then you run the whole approach again. And so then you can start to quantify you know, where could you track these particles and where did you miss them? So, you know, the particles that are all by themselves, you track very well. When the particles start to bunch together, you get a lot of these missed ones, which show up as red dots. You can keep track of the misses. And so where did you have the highest number of misses and where did you have the lowest ones? And sort of how accurate were you at each time step in this data set? So you could have sort of the different algorithms that you can use, and how accurate were they under different circumstances. You can then also start to look at something like the position jitter in a very simple experiment like that. And as you increase the percentage of the velocity that the jitter is, the number of bubbles that you match goes down. And what we can see is that sort of this matching works quite are quite a bit better with a fixed offset or adaptive offset when the jitter is zero, 
So we don't match all the bubbles perfectly with sort of the simple nearest neighbor approach at the zero, but that both of them fall down quite strongly and then, you know, this decay happens very rapidly. And so this allows you to kind of say, if you can figure out what the jitter is in your system, you can compare a number of the different algorithms and estimate what percentage of the particles you're able to track. And so, you know, in some cases, it might be important that you can track 100% of the particles, which means at this given density, you have to be basically here. So you can't use nearest neighbor. You already need to use a more complicated approach that's sort of you know, this adaptive or this fixed offset one, which means you sort of know your flow rate. And you're sort of limited to the very, very low rates of jitter. But if you only need to track half of your particles accurately, then you know you have much more flexibility with how much jitter is in your system. You can then see how this is connected to like density. So here we have sort of the object spacing as a percentage of the velocity. And sort of if the objects are spaced very far apart, then even with high jitters, we get a you know much higher uh, correct classification. And if the objects are spaced very close together, as this red sample is, then the accuracy of classification is very low. So the fixed offset works fairly well for this kind of zero case. But once you start to have any jitter or any noise, that drops off very quickly. And so we see that all of these things are quite closely related. And this is, again, just for one simple system that we're looking at here. But it gives you an idea of how these parameters change and how important it is to kind of do these simulations beforehand. Otherwise, you have no ability to really say what your measurement frequency should be, what your density should be, how easy it is to track these things, and how complicated of a method do you need to develop for the tracking. And so, yeah, so this helps us kind of pick these sort of things and then what we have to do is sort of decide for the experiment you're doing, what are the most important variables to get out, and how much accuracy do you need. And so the problem is, is that if we're looking at something like topology, a 5% error in sort of the bubble position leads to a 20% error in the topology. And that's something that, you know, means we have to have a very, very, very low error the bubble position and sort of in finding the bubbles. But if we're just interested in the flow field and we're averaging over many images anyways, then a 5% error in bubble position is actually less than 5% error in the flow field because you're able to group lots of bubbles together and group lots of images together so that single errors won't really cause major problems for you. Same things with sort of shape and volume is if you're looking at sort of distribution or changes in shape and volume over time and sort of average variables, that's fine. But if you're looking at sort of individual bubble changes, this can start to be a much larger problem. And if you're looking at like strain tensor calculations, or you're using your experiment to calculate a strain tensor, then you can be easily over 15% error for a strain tensor calculation because of a 5% change in sort of a um, bubble shape or volume. And so this really dictates how accurate all of the other steps have to be, what you're trying to extract from your final results, which then dictate what your field of view need to be, how frequently you need to measure, and everything else that you're doing. So yeah, you can extend nearest neighbor with this sort of bijective requirement so that rather than just looking forward, you look forward and backward. And you say you only keep the bubble if they both fall in. You can also say there's sort of a maximum displacement that's possible so that a bubble can't, or a point, can't move more than a certain amount. Otherwise, it's sort of not matched. You can include sort of these prior expected movements with sort of this fixed offset adaptive movement where you do this iteratively. You can also include a number of, you know, hypothesis testing where you assume all of the bubbles within a certain distance it could possibly follow, and then include only the hypotheses that at the end have the highest score, which is what a lot of the better methods do.
but they're of course much more complicated to implement. So yeah, so you can go to these multiple hypotheses, you can have merging and splitting particles, but each one of these things means you have a more complicated function, you have more parameters that you need to optimize, and it will take much longer to run. And so ideally you want to have experiments that don't require you to do this, but of course if your experiments are already done or can't be conducted any faster, then you'll need to come up with better tracking approaches in order to be confident or to get meaningful results out of your data. So now to quickly shift to sort of voxel-based approaches, um, you know, the approach we had before, you basically looked at all the center positions and tried to track all of them. With voxel approaches, you try to track sort of how do the voxels move. And so one of the easiest ways of doing this is sort of the standard image correlation, where you do the correlation between i at time zero at sort of position x, and i at time one at position x with this given offset r. And what you're trying to do is figure out what value of r makes this correlation highest. So what fixed offset applied to the image at time one gives you the image at time zero. So rather than looking at all the specific centers of mass or trying to threshold and segment everything, you just look at the whole image and you kind of shift it across itself until you get the output correlation. And so what you can see here is that when you then plot this R as U and V, you have this nice point here at sort of minus 2.5, which you can see matches up very well with our view of the model. So the time zero is here, and at time one, sort of moved up that much. Yeah? R. R. So R is this value here. Yeah. It's the shift. So it's the shift that you apply to the image at time one when you do this correlation with the time zero image. And so we see kind of the one peak there, which matches up what we think the experiment should be showing us. Can anyone say why there's these other peaks? Yeah. So because we have a periodic structure, it's actually you know, for us, intuitively, it looks like the image is going from time zero to time one in that up step. But in fact, it could be going all the way over and up. It could be going all the way down. Or it could be going sort of some sort of diagonal shift. And because the structure is so perfectly periodic, we actually get multiple of these peaks. And so we don't, in fact, know that that is really the movement that happened. That's the movement that kind of makes the most sense to us, because that's the smallest one. But depending on what your system is or what your experiment is, all of these other peaks could be a possibility. And so that's something you have with dense and periodic systems, is sort of these multiple peaks that show up, which correspond to sort of different um, possible movements you could have had between the first time point and the second time point. And in fact, all of these sort of have the same score in the system, and so it's very difficult to know which one would be the highest one. And so there we would just use the criteria. The one that's closest to the zero, zero point is the one that happened, but in other situations you couldn't necessarily use that assumption. Yeah. Uh, is the contour. So basically this is just a contour map of these red values that you see here. So each one of these red values indicates the correlation at that r value. So r of u equals 0, v equals negative 2.5 is then a correlation of 0.3. The blue lines basically just show a contour map of this image. So it's the same information, just a different representation of it. Because a lot of times the contour map is easier to look at 
then this map by itself. But like the proposal, I was like, what's this a lot? Like, why is this strange shape? Here, like this. Yeah. Um, why is it a strange shape? It might just be the way it's plotted. Because all of the points are circular. So it should be actually circular on this axis too. But yeah, it might just be that there's not enough points in this graph to make a reasonable contour map. But yeah, I should probably take that out. So now with random image position, so instead of having a very simple grid with a very simple flow, which you know is the easiest thing to make for your simulated data, but not always the best for doing something like a voxel-based approach because you get these other peaks that show up. If you here take random images, now we can see very easily, okay, this move down, you know, there isn't a lot of other hypotheses that you could have about how that movement looks. And now if we take the correlation, we see that there is one clear maximum value down there. And there's some other non-zero values but none of them are as high as that maximum, and so it's very easy to decide what the movement actually was. And yeah, here, just ignore the blue lines. They don't help you see much. You can then sort of start to extend correlation, where instead of just looking at this plus r, you look at sort of this r, s, and theta, where you could sort of have a whole transformation of your original image where you now have a correlation as a function of how much the image was scaled and how much the image was rotated. Um, again, the blue lines you can kind of ignore, but you can then start to see a little bit where that peak might be in this graph. You can then start to have more complicated changes where sort of this whole image, you know, shrinks a little bit, you know, where these points move down and these points move up where correlation then doesn't really have the ability to show you what's happening in this image. So here you just see kind of a big blur blob near the center with some values up here and some values down there, which means that you know the best overall R value for the whole image is probably somewhere at zero, zero, but that doesn't necessarily explain all of the movement very well. So when you start to see that peak get flatter and flatter. That means that you probably have a number of different kinds of motion that are all being included in the same correlation. And so this is where you can then subdivide the data. So you can take it and break your data up into a number of different windows, like we show here, and calculate what that correlation is inside of each of these windows. And so now you have sort of the correlation function at each one of these different points rather than the whole thing sort of brought together. And so now we can kind of show as a vector where that maximum occurred at each point or where the maximum were. And so each one of these points refers to one of these boxes that we had before. And we can now see kind of what the movement was at each one of those points. We see that some of them are a little bit erroneous, so that we have this one going massively in this direction, which isn't really accurate. It should be going in this direction, but it gives us a basic approximation for what's going on. So if we use too large of a, you know, if you use a larger window, you get a better sampling, so you have more pixels inside, which means you get a better sort of statistic on this correlation but you get less information because you sort of divided your image up into smaller, um, coarser pieces so that when you then try to reflect what actually moved, you now only have four points where you can calculate that vector. And so there's a trade-off between how you define these boxes and how you get a nice sampling of what's actually moving or flowing in your image. You can then sort of have the opposite problem if you use too small of an image, where, you know, here, this entire window is filled up with red, and so you're not going to get a particularly meaningful correlation function between these two images because the red is simply everywhere. 
And so, you know, you can show with pretty high resolution all the different vectors and arrows you create, but there's a lot of arrows that are pointing sometimes in completely the wrong direction because you're oversampling your image. So we can have sort of experiments like shearing where we try to track that and that's sort of an example where you need to have lots of different points so that you can start to see that shearing behavior that occurs. You have a lot of noise and so it requires a fair amount of filtering to get that to work well. Um, but yeah. Compression is something that we can see very clearly. Basically all of these dots just got smaller. But the result in this graph doesn't make that very clear. And so you have these arrows going everywhere because your assumption was the points sort of moved in a direction, and that isn't necessarily justified in the results that we see. So you can start to introduce physics here, where rather than just having a correlation term, you have some sort of cost to that correlation, where you include things like sort of how did the surrounding point move? So you, will, you don't want to have a completely discontinuous um, movement field. Um, what is the maximum deformation or force you would expect in your system? What are the material properties? And so, you know, you can have, uh, like, bone, for example. If you have a very small displacement in bone, that creates a huge amount of force versus, you know, soft tissue or air, where a very small displacement has almost zero force. And so you would have a very different term you would put in there. Um, and this is sort of the sanity check you can put on your correlation to have it mean something in sort of the physical world. And so by adding sort of this lambda, which is a weight, and then some sort of cost for the deformation, you can get a correlation term that's more relevant to what you're actually looking at. Um, so I think we'll leave this part out now because we're already kind of over on time and cover that at the beginning of next lecture if you're interested. Is so there are any questions on that? Yeah? Yeah. Um, I think the, they perform differently under different circumstances. And so if you look at that training model and you simply score it on the training model, how well they were able to fit the training and test data you had, the neural network I think worked better. But if you look how well does it perform on sort of a large variety of different images that are normally taken at a hospital, they perform very differently because they have very different types of errors that come in. So the neural network approach um, is actually generally a little bit more stable because it's less sensitive to these single changes because if we look at the approach we manually made, there's a lot of sort of clearly defined rules inside it, which means as soon as one of those rules doesn't work or doesn't apply to the data, you have a huge change. You know that if you have a third thing inside of there that also has error in it, then the tool counts the first two and then throws everything else out. Versus with the neural network approach, it doesn't know that there's only supposed to be two lungs. And so if there's a third thing that looks like lung, that will classify it as lung as well. And so it's really about, it's very difficult to say what's the best approach. It's more of what approach gives you the results you need more reliably in your data. And so, um, yeah, that isn't sort of a clear winner and loser. You just have two different approaches that fail under different settings. And so that also is kind of part of the machine learning. What you often do is you often take multiple different models and you sort of bring them together and you have them vote. So you might have one vote coming from the standard approach, one vote coming from a pure neural network approach, and by bringing them together, you have a more accurate image than either of the two models by themselves. And so particularly when you look at the larger competitions in Kaggle, I mean, one of the 
the Snow Free Hunch blog from Kaggle. They have one of the more recent winners in it. And the approach that he used, and I think it required six different models run on two different machines. Um, I think it's Kyle Lee. And so this is kind of the overview of what his model was. So the data that came into it, the things that were sort of spit out, and how you sort of bagged and combined the different models together. And I think here you have a combination of neural networks there and Yeah, I think they're all different neural networks here that are being combined together to get your final result. But you see that it actually involves a number of different tools that you then try to bring together to get the best result. And so here the task was to classify the images into different categories. So what is road? What is um, lake? What is uh, you know, air? Or whatever these other phases were from satellite images. And so yeah, buildings, structures, roads, standing water, and networks that were then made to work with other ones in order to classify these structures well. So that standing water plus waterway was sort of the combination of these networks with these inputs, with these other networks and these other inputs. And so that for really complicated problems, you often have a combination of a lot of different models in order to get really good results. And I think the prize for this one was like $100,000, if I'm not mistaken. And it was you know, split up into a number of different steps. And yeah, you can see how everything was kind of brought together. And yeah, how, they, how we tweaked the model, how we improved it, how he sort of tested a number of different depths and widths and sampling sizes see how well it can accurately do each step. And then of course a lot of this includes the realistic factors of you have a huge amount of training data and you need to somehow parallelize training this model over multiple different machines with multiple different sets of parameters and so you can't always take maybe the best approach. You might have to sort of divide up the task into different pieces and have each piece done somewhere else. Which actually leads into very well the sort of things we'll start doing in the next lecture. Um, so for the exercises, um, there's the standard ones which are available in NIME. There's also um, a quite cool data set, the circadian rhythm in the brain where you basically have a bunch of neurons in the brain which are measured with a fluorescent microscope. And the goal here is to kind of track how the different neurons move with time. So you have these different points, and you want to be able to see how they move from one image to the next. And so here we have this basic kind of nearest neighbor approach where you sort of take the difference between the two images as a distance, and you find the minimum one. But it's an interesting data set to take and try more complicated approaches to see how you can track the neuron movement very well. And so if we look at, I think, the the actual data set here, you see that there's sort of some initial kind of movement upwards and then movement down again. And so what you'd like to be able to do with this data is track the firing of an individual neuron. And so that requires tracking how these neurons move over the course of the image, or sort of the course of the time series. And so it first means finding all of the neurons, and then it means making sure you can accurately track them from frame to frame to frame. And so this is quite an interesting problem to work on. And it's a nice data set because there's other people who have been working on the data set as well. So you can go to the other kernels and see what people have done to kind of process it to get other ideas for what you might do with it.
Um, but yeah. So, um, yeah, if there's no questions, then that's it for this lecture. And then next week is the big data um, and scaling up lecture. So how to bring all this stuff together for solving much larger problems and sort of an introduction to what tools are available for that and how that works. Okay, so 